everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. We're going to get started in about one minute, so promptly at noon Eastern time. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So hi, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining today. Welcome to the NOAA OMIC seminar series. I am your host, Katherine Egan. I am the NOAA OAR OMICS coordinator, and I sit in NOAA Ocean Exploration. I also sit on the NOAA OMICS working group as the executive secretary and subcommittee co-lead. Omics, which is a suite of tools used to analyze DNA, RNA, proteins, and metabolites, has become a large priority here at NOAA in the last few years. We established this seminar series in an effort to increase transparency and collaboration and highlight the incredible omics-related research currently underway both within and outside of NOAA. The seminars from this series are all made available on YouTube and posted up on our omics website. There should be a link to the website in the chat right now. As uh, participants, you are muted, but feel free to type questions into the questions for staff box throughout the presentation. At the end, I will read the questions for the presenter to answer. Okay, so with that, our presentation today is titled Metagenomic Discovery of Microbial and Host Genetic Features of the Marine Polychaete. Um, I cannot pronounce the scientific name, so when Jean presents, I will have her pronounce it for me. Um, but of the marine polychaete that colonizes a methane hydrate in the Gulf of Mexico. And as I said, our presenter today is Dr. Jean Lim. So Jean, before I properly present you to our audience today, I'm going to go ahead and give you screen sharing permissions so you can get all set up um, while I do your introduction. Okay, so Dr. Jean Lim was previously a postdoctoral associate at the Cooperative Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Studies at the University of Miami. She is an expert in bioinformatics and high performance computing and has collaborated with NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory, or AOML, on various omics projects. Her research focuses on host microbe symbiosis and microbial ecology. So Jean, thank you so much for presenting today. We really appreciate you being here. Um, we can see your title slide, so it looks all good from my end, um, and I will now pass it off to you to begin the presentation. Hi, um, thank you for the introduction, Catherine. Um, I'm Jean, and today I'm going to share my research, which is on using metagenomics to discover microbial and host genes in a deep sea marine polychaete. So uh, the scientific name of the marine polychaete that I was studying is uh, Cerso methanicola. It belongs to the family Hesionidae, and is also known as the methane ice worm. And I'm going to refer it to uh, as the ice worm uh, throughout this talk. So the ice worm is the only macrofaunal species known to inhabit methane hydrates. The picture on the left here shows a close-up view of the ice worm. And the picture in the middle shows multiple ice worms inhabiting depressions on the methane hydrate surface. And the picture on the right shows a close-up view of a methane hydrate. So the ice worm possesses a functional gut, and it's thought to be a bacteriovore that feeds on a variety of bacteria. No intracellular symbionts and epibionts have been observed in the ice worm under the microscope, which is pretty unlike many other deep sea animals that contain chemosynthetic symbionts that make food for them via microbial carbon fixation. So methane hydrates are unique features of the marine environment. They are found in smaller amounts within uh, and beneath permafrost that contains large amounts of biomass stored as methane. Uh, most methane 
Hydrates are formed from cold seeps, uh, where seep fluids rich in methane slowly diffuses to the seafloor from geological faults or cracks uh, at the bottom. Uh, methane can be formed in two ways. Biogenic methane is formed through microbial processes like methanogenesis, and thermogenic methane is generated from the breakup of organic carbon at high temperatures and high pressures in deep sea sediments. Um, because methane has a lower density than its surrounding seawater and sediments, as it rises from the seafloor, uh, the low temperature and the high pressure in the deep sea uh, will freeze it into a crystalline uh, cage-like structure where methane is uh, encased in a hydrogen bonded uh, structure of water molecules. And this structure is what is known as a methane hydrate. Methane hydrates are really challenging to study because they are unstable uh, at surface temperatures and pressure. So based on previous isotope-based and microscopy studies, we know that the ice worm feeds on a variety of bacteria, and we know that the ice worm does not have any intracellular symbionts. Um, previous studies have also sequenced uh, phylogenetic marker genes of the ice worm itself for DNA barcoding purposes. However, we still do not have high-resolution genetic information on the ice worm and its microbiome. So our study is the first metagenomic analysis of uh, the ice worm Cerso methanicola. And with the metagenomics data, what we are hoping to do is to be able to characterize the microbial communities associated with the ice worm. And we are hoping to also identify genes that are related to the worm host. So uh, for this study, the live worm specimens uh, were collected at around 500 meters depth at the Green Canyon area in the Gulf of Mexico. And the samples were collected in 2009 before the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, our sampling site was highlighted in red in the maps over here. And um, the collection site was near the site highlighted in green where the ice worm was first discovered in 1997. And uh, our sampling site was also near uh, other areas highlighted in gray where ice worms have previously been found. And so far, the ice worm has only been uh, reported and found in the Gulf of Mexico. So the ice worm samples were collected uh, in a research cruise in 2009, and uh, it was collected with a submersible named Johnson Ceiling 2, which was operated by the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. Uh, and Kelly and Luke from AOML went on this cruise and were on the submersible. And after the samples were collected, they were brought on board the research vehicle for processing. So these worms were collected live and rinsed with 0.2 micron filtered seawater before dissection. Um, they were not pre-treated with any antiseptics or, or antibiotics. And from each worm, the gut contents uh, were extracted with a sterile syringe. And the gut contents had the appearance of clear liquid with black particulates, and they do not include the actual gut organ or tissue. And uh, the gut contents from two worms were pulled and used for Illumina high six sequencing to produce a library which we call Library G. Uh, we also use the gut content of another worm for Illumina MySeq sequencing to produce Library G My. And after the dissection, the leftover worm fragments were also, also collected for sequencing, and this contains a variety of tissue, including heads, bristles, and the actual guts. So the fragments from seven worms were pulled together and uh, sent off for Illumina high six sequencing to produce library W. And uh, these pictures over here are the pictures of the ice worms when they were being processed on the re research vehicle. Uh, so with the metagenomic data, our first goal was to characterize the microbial communities associated with the ice worm. And this work was recently uh, published and highlighted in Applied and Environmental Microbi Microbiology, and I will go through what I did in detail in the following slides. So as I mentioned, the worm samples were collected in 2009, and they were sequenced around 2012. So back then, Illumina sequencing was not as accessible and affordable as it is today. Um, we could only sequence a total of three libraries that were pulled from the gut contents and body fragments of the worm. So one of the bottlenecks to omics discovery was in data acquisition because this uh, ice worm samples were rare and we were only able to sequence a few of them in a few libraries. And the metagenomics data was analyzed in 2013 by Weixin as part of uh, her undergraduate thesis project. 
And back then, there were also not as many bioinformatics tools as today, and reference sequence databases did not contain as many sequences. So another bottleneck uh, back in 2013 was in data processing. When I joined CMAS in 2020, I reanalyzed uh, the data with newer bioinformatic tools and updated reference databases. Uh, from these three uh, sequence libraries, the first thing I did was to perform read-based taxonomic profiling, uh, where I tried to identify the microbial composition in the iceworm based on this short 100 base pair read fragment sequence. The software that I use for read-based taxonomic profiling include PhiloFlash, which maps this read to the Silva 16S and 18S RNA gene reference database, um, single M, uh, which maps uh, these reads to a separate database of 14 single copy marker genes. Uh, and one of our concerns uh, was that uh, Philo Flash and single M may miss out uh, sequences from uncultured microbial taxa with no defined taxonomy. So to be able to capture these reads, I also created custom databases that contain nucleotide sequences from uncultured taxa, uh, previously sequenced from methane hydrates and sieves. And this database includes sequences of uh, the particulate methane monooxygenase or PMO gene in methanotrophs, uh, methyl coenzyme M reductase or MCRA gene in methanogens, and 16S RNA genes from uncultured te taxa. And this custom database was uh, created based on uh, our literature review. And uh, besides uh, taxonomic profiling at the read base level, I also use PhiloFlash to assemble reads in these iceworm libraries into full length uh, microbial 16S RNA genes. So, these read based taxonomic profiling tools consistently show that uh, the reads assigned to the genus Sulfurospirillum and the family Sulfurospirillaceae are dominant in the iceworm libraries. So this big table here, here sums up the read counts of abundant microbial families uh, that are identified by uh, different methods. And the table over left here shows uh, the reads uh, identified by PhiloFlash by mapping to the Silva 16S and 18S RNA gene database. Um, the table on the right here shows abundant reads that are ident identified by Magic Blast by mapping them to uh, my custom 16S RNA genes from uncultured taxa in methane hydrates and methane seeps. And both tables show that more than 60% of the map reads were assigned to the family Sulfurospirillaceae. So using PhiloFlash, I also assembled a total of 12 full-length 16S RNA gene sequences that are assigned to various uh, bacterial taxa belonging to the order Campylobacterialis, Desulfobacterialis, Mycoplasmatelis, uh, Entoplasmatelis, Enterobacterialis, Chitini vibronellis, and alpha 324 and alpha protobacteria. Um, the full length 16S RNA gene sequence with the highest coverage and the number of reads uh, mapped to both libraries uh, were both uh, assigned to the genus Sulfurospirillum uncultured. Uh, and its closest relative is uh, another Sulfurospirillum sequence that was found in the bioturbating lockworm Aranicola marina. So the dominance of sulfurospirillum in the iceworm metagenomes is pretty surprising and unusual because sulfurospirillum are typically free-living and not associated with the gut of any, uh, any animal. The bacterial taxonomic comp composition in the iceworm metagenomes was also distinct from the microbiomes of its surrounding methane hydrate habitat. So this figure here is an example of the composition of 16S RNA gene clone libraries that are that were sequenced from methane hydrate samples at Green Canyon. And Green Canyon is the same general area in the Gulf of Mexico where the ice worms were found. So from the figure, uh, you could see that the taxa distribution was more even and uh, abundant bacteria included uh, delta protobacteria, which are typical sulfate reducers, um, hydrocarbon associated bacteria, uh, as well as epsilon protobacteria, which is now known as Campylobacterialis. So from this same study, uh, the authors also showed that among archaeal 16S RNA genes from the methane hydrate samples, uh, anaerobic methane oxidizing archaea, or ANME, was dominant. And um, the authors also found other archaeal taxa in their methane hydrate samples, which included methanosarcinellis, methanomicrobialis, thermoplasmatelis, crane archaeota, as well as unclassified urea archaeota. However, in the iceworm metagenomes that we sequenced, 
uh, reads and sequences that were related to methanotrols, methanogens, or methylotrols were low in abundance uh, in the ice worm microbiome. Uh, for example, the magic blast search against my custom 16S RNA gene database of uncultured taxa from methane hydrates and seeps showed that only 0.17% of 573 uh, reads were mapped to the bacterial family Methylomonadaceae. And I was not able to assemble any full-length 16S RNA gene sequences of archaea or assemble any archaea genome from the iceworm um, metagenomic libraries. I also tried to map the iceworm reads to genomes from methane hydrates or methane oxidizing environments, and this also showed a uh, very low percentage recruitment. And our paper has more details on the low abundances of these sequences in the iceworm microbiome. So besides analysis at the read level and 16S RNA gene level, uh, I also assemble um, the metagenomes from the uh, worm fragment and gut content library separately to produce uh, two metagenomes, which we call metagenome W and metagenome G. Uh, I also assembled the gut content library that was sequenced with MySeq, but that library, the metagenome was pretty redundant to the high seq gut content library with much lower coverage, so I did not use that library for downstream analysis. Uh, with these metagenomes, I was able to perform binning um, to bin these metagenomes into metagenome assembled genomes or MAX, and binning was performed using two different software, Metabat2 and MaxBin. And the MAX that were binned by these two software were combined and dereplicated and optimized using DAS tool. Uh, and I used Anvil to uh, further refine uh, the MAX to uh, generate final versions of this MAX. So each MAX was checked for completeness with uh, check M, and each MAX was also assigned a taxonomy using the Genome Taxonomy Database Toolkit called uh, GTDBTK. So the metagenomic assembly and binning produced a total of 16 uh, metagenome assembled genomes or MAX from the iceworm gut contents and worm fragments. Um, 12 of these uh, MAX were recovered uh, from the gut content, and uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but this max were uh, this max had the prefix G, and um, the remaining max were uh, four, four max were recovered from the worm fragments, and this max had the prefix W on the phylogenetic tree. So uh, two identical, almost identical max were bin from the worm fragment and gut content metagenomes, and these were classified as sulfurospirillum and recruited the most reads uh, from the both libraries. Uh, there were five max that were classified as desulfobacterialis, and these are typically sulfate-reducing bacteria, and uh, the other max that I recovered were classified as sulfurimonas, sulfurobaceae, covilia, pseudoarteromonas undina, RSD84, Rickettsialis, and Mycoplasmatelis. Uh, from the worm fragment library, uh, I also recovered a MAC classified as SAR324, and among all of the MACs that were recovered from the metagenome, this MAC uh, was found dominant only in the worm fragment library compared to the gut content library. So to get an idea of the microbial functional potential in the ice worm microbiome, I used a combination of tools to annotate uh, the metagenomes. So the metagenomes, uh, the coding regions of the metagenomes were predicted using a prodigal implemented in Envio, and I also used Envio uh, to map the sequences in the metagenomes to NCBI's database of a uh, cluster of orthologous groups or COGS, and I also submitted these predicted protein sequences to the GhostQuella server that will map uh, these sequences to the CAKE database to get uh, KO or CAKE orthology terms uh, that are related to different uh, microbial pathways. And I also annotated each MAC uh, using metabolic. So metabolic is an automated tool that uh, identifies specifically biogeochemical cycling genes uh, in each MAC. And I also uh, submitted the MACs to the RAS server to identify biogeochemical cyclings that are not picked up by metabolic. And uh, in order to also uh, uh, discover novel genes that would possibly be missed by these automated annotation tools, I also compiled a list of uh, sulfurospirillum and desulfobacterial sequences from the literature uh, to look for other genes that are not picked up by this software. So using these annotation tools, I identified a variety of electron-accepting reactions from the isolon microbiome. Uh, so the 
dominant sulfurospirulum uh, MAC uh, is labeled as uh, G18, G15, and W8 uh, on this slide. And uh, this dominant sulfurospirulum MAC uh, is involved in a variety of electron accepting reactions, which included uh, aerobic respiration and the reduction of nitrogenous compounds like uh, nitrate and nitrite, uh, and reduction of sulfur compounds like uh, tetrathionate and sulfate, uh, thiosulfate disprop disproportionation and fermentation. Uh, the other MACs that I recovered in this study also contain uh, genes uh, in different pathways for some of these electron accepting reactions. So uh, based on the gene annotations and also based on literature search on previous studies, uh, we predicted the dominant sulfurospirulum species in the ice worm uh, to be facultatively anaerobic sulfur reducers. Um, the SAR-324 MAC recovered from the worm fragments of the ice worm showed potential for aerobic heterotrophic polysulfide reduction. And all the MACs that were classified as the sulfobacterialis show potential for sulfate reduction. Um, uh, besides sulfur uh, reduction, other MACs uh, that are classified as sulfurimonas, uh, sulfuro, BCA, and coelia uh, show the potential for sulfur oxidation, oxidation and uh, nitrate reduction. And uh, I also identified two other MACs uh, classified as pseudoalteromonas undina and mycoplasmatilis that were potentially uh, chemoheterotrophic or fermenting bacteria. Um, the alpha proteobacteria max that I recovered from this study uh, did not show any uh, clear uh, metabolic pathways because I did not identify uh, any key metabolic genes in this max. So this is a very busy and complicated looking slide, but the take home message is that I found a variety of carbon pathways in the gut content and worm fragment metagenomes. So most of the MACs uh, contain genes that are involved in central carbohydrate metabolism that includes gly glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, fatty acid oxidation, TCA cycle, and a whole bunch of uh, acetate conversions. Um, the MAC that were classified as the sulfobacterialis uh, could potentially couple uh, sulfate uh, reduction to acetate oxidation oxidation where acetate uh, uh, will, can be oxidized to uh, hydrogen and carbon dioxide. And uh, there are also other genes that I found in the MACs that were involved in uh, polysaccharide and oligosaccharide uh, degradation, fermentation of amino acids, uh, C1 compound oxidation, as well as uh, the reductive uh, TCA cycle. Uh, so uh, one of the interesting things that we found was that uh, there were genes that are involved in uh, hydrocarbon oxidation in the uh, ice worm microbiome. So methane hydrates, besides trapping methane, can also trap hydrocarbon gases such as ethane, propane, isobutane, and pentane. And during worm dissection, uh, we noticed a petroleum smell uh, that was emitted when the guts were pierced. So uh, we tried looking for genes that are involved in hydrogen uh, hydrocarbon degradation from the metagenomes, and we found that all the sulfobacterialis max contain genes that are homologous to an alkyl succinate synthase gene cluster uh, that was predicted uh, to be involved in alkane degradation. And from the metagenomes, I also identified uh, other aromatic compound degradation gene clusters uh, in one MAC that is classified as sulfurimonas as well as other contexts in the metagenomes that did not belong to any MAC. And these gene clusters predict the degradation of other hydrocarbons, including benzoate, toluene, silene, and phenol. And besides uh, carbon and uh, uh, electron accepting reactions, the MACs that were recovered uh, from the gut content of the ice worm also has genes for the biosynthesis of uh, amino acids and B vitamins. And particularly, we found uh, genes that are involved in the vitamin B12 biosynthesis pathway in um, the gut content microbes. And this is interesting because animals are not capable of synthesizing their own vitamin B12. So our data suggests that the microbial communities in the gut content of the ice worm may provide a source of amino acids and B vitamins like vitamin B12 um, to the worm. So uh, to summarize, um, 
what we found from the ice worm microbiome was that uh, the gut content and worm fragment metagenomes were dominated by sequences classified as sulfur-reducing sulfurospirillum. And this is interesting because sulfurospirillum are typically free-living and not associated with the gut of any animal. And uh, we also saw that the microbial composition of the ice worm metagenomes was distinct from the microbial uh, com composition in uh, the, its surrounding methane hydrate habitats. And based on uh, functional annotations from different tools, we show that the ice worm may obtain carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, and B vitamins from its microbial communities. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and uh, move from the microbial communities associated with the ice worm uh, to talk about the genes related to the ice worm itself. And this work is recently submitted uh, as a separate short paper to the Frontiers in Marine Science. So while looking for the microbial genes in the ice worm metagenomes, we had already used a uh, phylo flash to assemble uh, full-length uh, ribosomal small subunit sequences. And we also assembled uh, uh, the metagenomes from the gut content and the worm fragment libraries. So um, for the worm-related genes, I use a phylo flash to also assemble full-length 18S RNA gene sequences from the worm host. And to look for other worm-related phylogenetic marker genes, uh, I downloaded a list of marker gene sequences that were previously uh, sequenced from the ice worm uh, as part of a DNA, metabar DNA barcoding. And I searched uh, these genes uh, uh, against the ice worm metagenome using BLAST. And to look for other functional genes, I also uh, uh, searched the ghost koala annotations for protein sequences classified as analida. And uh, all analida sequences predicted by ghost koala, koala were predicted based on sequence similarity to genes uh, in this freshwater leech species, Pelodella robusta. So not surprisingly, the 16S, 18S, and 28S RNA genes and the cytochrome C oxidase subunit 1 COX-1 sequences assembled from the ice worm uh, were most closely related to other uh, uh, to similar phylogenetic marker genes uh, sequenced from the same species. And the phylogenetic tree generated from the concatenated alignment of these marker genes uh, was also consistent with the most recent phylogeny of uh, the ice worm genus Cerso and the family Hesionidae. So uh, there are other Cerso species that are related to the ice worm and they do not inhabit methane hydrates and instead they inhabit whale falls, seeps, and hydrothermal vents. And uh, Cerso methanicola, uh, the ice worm, is most closely related and it's a sister species to Cerso dalai lamai. And I tried looking for pictures of its sister species, but I couldn't find any picture on the internet. Uh, so while I was searching for the cytochrome C oxidase subunit 1 sequence for the ice worm, I noticed that the CLI gene was part of a long 18,000 base pair contact from the gut content metagenome and another long 16,000 contact from the worm fragment metagenome. So I searched these long contacts against NCBI's nucleotide database and uh, they match the mitochondrial genomes of other polychaete species. So uh, I suspected that these long contacts uh, belong to the ice worm mitochondrial genome or mitogenome. And I annotated these contacts with automated tools that include uh, MitoS and MitoZ. And um, the contact from the gut content metagenome had a complete set of mitochondrial genes. And this was used as the draft mitogenome for subsequent uh, annotations. and uh, these uh, annotations were manually reviewed and corrected uh, using wet blast alignments uh, against the most closely related mitogenome to the ice worm, which is uh, Gonera japonica, and it is a marine uh, polychaete. Um, the final version of the ice worm mitogenome is non-circular uh, and it's not closed, but it contains a complete set of uh, uh, protein coding genes, uh, tRNAs and RNAs. Uh, so the, the draft genome of the uh, ice worm is 17,403 base pairs with 39.3 uh, GC content. So the ice worm mitogenome is the only mitogenome that has been sequenced so far from the Hesionidae family. Uh, so I was not able to make uh, any comparisons of the mitogenome with uh, other related Cerso uh, species. So I constructed a phylogenetic tree to compare these mitogenomes with other members uh, of the polychaete order Phylodocida. 
So on this phylogenetic tree, the ice worm um, minor genome forms a well-supported clade with the marine polychaetes uh, Gonetta japonica uh, and uh, Glycera capitata as well as Hemipodia simplex and all three of these are uh, marine polychaetes that are somewhat related to the ice worm. I also tried to look at uh, codon usage bias in the ice worm mitogenome. So um, codon usage bias is measured by uh, these relative synonymous codon usage or RSCU values. And uh, uh, RSCU value of one, which is represented by a horizontal line over here, shows no codon usage bias and values above the horizontal line shows positive bias and values below the uh, horizontal line shows a negative uh, uh, codon bias. So as you can see in the ice worm mitogenome, some uh, codons are preferred, uh, and these are above the horizontal line, and some uh, codons are less preferred. Uh, but currently, we don't really have a set of uh, mitogenomes to compare uh, the ice worm mitogenomes to in detail. So, but in future, as we uh, sequence more mitogenomes from uh, species that are taxonomically or ecologically related to the ice worm, we would be able to compare codon usage bias between species in different uh, habitats to actually study uh, possible codon usage adaptations to different habitats or ways of life in different polychaetes. So uh, besides phylogenetic marker genes, I was also mining the metagenomic annotations for functional genes. And uh, I uh, looked at the most abundant uh, KO terms that are related to analytes uh, that were identified by Gold's Coella. Um, so the most abundant KO terms was uh, related to in inexin. And inexin are proteins that form gap junctions between neurons and are also potentially use for, useful for studying uh, analyte phylogeny. Uh, and most of the abundant uh, KO terms uh, are related to neuronal and signaling functions uh, that are, and these are represented as blue bars in this chart over here. And other abundant KO terms were related to uh, other types of function that includes adhesion, biosynthesis, carbohydrate-related functions, cell division, structure of functions, and transport. And as I mentioned, these uh, KO terms were identified by Ghost Coella, and these are mainly based on similarities to sequences with the genome of the freshwater leech, uh, Helopdetla robusta, because this is pretty much the only reference analyte genome in the CAKE database. And um, kind of the problem with this is, is that this species lives in a freshwater habitat, which is pretty different uh, from the habitat that the ice worm lives in. So in order to find the genomes of uh, other gut-containing marine uh, polychaetes that are more similar to the ice worm, we searched the literature uh, and we found the genome of uh, this po marine polychaete called Capitella teleta. So Capitella teleta is an opportunistic polychaete that feeds on organic rich and polluted shallow water sediments. Uh, and in order to find out uh, some of the genes that are present in the ice worm that are similar to genes in Capitella teleta, what I first did was to map the metagenomic reads from the ice worm gut content and worm fragment libraries to the genome of Capitella teleta and counted the reads mapped to different genes um, using a, a software called HTSeq. And here uh, I found that a majority of the reads uh, were mapped to the 28S, 5S, uh, 8S, and 18S RNA operon of Capitella uh, Teleta operon. And uh, some of the other uh, reads mapped to genes uh, that encode structural components of the polychaetes, such as collagen and uh, actin and other genes mapped to signaling proteins, hypothetical genes, uh, as well as uh, uh, genes involved in other functions. So there were not a lot of genes that were mapped to the Capitella teleta genome, so we tried uh, another more targeted uh, approach. So as I mentioned, Capitella teleta fits on marine sediments, and uh, previous studies have suggested that uh, Capitella teleta can potentially degrade polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAH, without help from its gut microbiome. And uh, this is uh, suggested to be uh, performed using cytochrome P450 proteins. So uh, some cytochrome P450 proteins showed increased uh, gene expression when Capitella teleta was exposed to PAH. So uh, we tried to uh, use a more targeted approach uh, to map uh, the reads to cytochrome P450's uh, 
in capital Talera, but we did not see any reads uh, from the ice worm mapping uh, to the cytochrome P450s. So I downloaded the protein sequences of uh, cytochrome P450 proteins from Capitola Taleda and searched them against the ice worm metagenomes. And using this method, I identified 52 protein sequences in the ice worm that were homologous uh, to cytochrome P450 protein sequences in Capitola Taleda at various percentage identity. So the figure here shows the cluster of sequences that are related to P450 proteins from either uh, Capitola Taleda, that are, uh, which is shown in red circles, and the ice worm gut contents, which are shown in blue circles, and the ice worm worm fragments, which are shown in green circles. So uh, from this figure, uh, you can see that at 100% identity, all the P450 protein sequences uh, are, re uh, are related uh, to the ice worm, and they are not related to Capitola Taleda. Uh, but at 30% uh, to 70% identity, uh, I noticed some uh, uh, isoworm sequences that are related to uh, sequences in Capitola Taleda cytochrome P450. Uh, so here you can see that there are some circles uh, from the isoworm that are connected uh, to circles representing Capitola Taleda, which shows that uh, these are homologs of the cytochrome P450 protein sequences in Capitola Taleda. So one of the cytochrome P450 proteins uh, that I was interested in was uh, CYP331A1. And this particular uh, cytochrome P450 protein showed increased gene expression when Capitella Taleda was exposed to PAH. So the uh, CYP331A1 sequence that I found in the ice worm was 49% uh, identical to uh, the CYP331A1 sequence that I found in Capitella Taleda. And uh, because the protein structure of this uh, protein sequence is not available, I performed homology modeling to predict the structure of CYP331A1 in Capitella Taleda and Cerso Mithenicola uh, using a closely rel related protein structure template that was identified by the homology modeling software Swiss model. So the template protein structure that I use for homology modeling is a human cytochrome P450 protein that is complex uh, with the HIV drug retinovir. So uh, based on this structure, uh, I predicted the structure of Capitola Taleda uh, P cytochrome P450 as well as the ice worm cytochrome P450. And uh, as you can see, the ice worm uh, structure that was predicted was shown in red, and it does contact uh, some of the binding sites. However, as you can see, the ice worm structure is much smaller because the protein sequence was only 88 amino acids compared to uh, the other uh, protein sequences of uh, uh, its homologs. So uh, uh, future studies has still needs to be done to actually confirm that this is indeed a cytochrome P450 protein sequence with a hydrocarbon uh, pH degrading function. So uh, to summarize, the second part of my talk is a general overview of uh, the marker genes and functional genes uh, related to Cerso Mithenicola. So from the metagenomes, I assemble 18S RNA and 28S RNA gene sequences of the ice worm that were similar and near identical to previously reported reference sequences. And I also uh, assemble the mitochondrial genome of the ice worm, which is the first mitogenome sequence of the family Hisionidae. And um, I also identified functional genes that are involved in a variety of functions uh, in the ice worm. And lastly, uh, comparisons of the cytochrome P450 protein annotations suggest that uh, ice worm may contain some of these uh, gene homologs that may possibly be able to respond to or detoxify uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAH. Uh, so this is the end of my talk. And I just wanted to acknowledge these people that are involved in this project. Uh, so this project is spearheaded by Kelly uh, from NOAA AML, and the cruise was organized by Craig Young from the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology. Uh, most of the sequencing was facilitated by Terry Gastelan from UCSD, and uh, I analyzed the metagenomic data with uh, advice and suggestions from Luke Thompson uh, from NGI. And there are also many other people that contributed to various aspects of this work, including sample dissection, sequencing, and data analysis, and they are all uh, acknowledged in detail in uh, the papers. Uh, and so I am happy to take any questions. Uh,
related to this talk. And if you have any questions, you can also uh, email me at this uh, email address. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jean. That was a fantastic presentation. Really appreciate you coming in to um, talk on this really interesting work today. Um, yeah, if folks have any questions, feel free to type them in to the questions for staff box. Um, or like Jean said, if you want to reach directly out to her, you can uh, reach her here at these emails. So we don't have any questions that have come in yet. I think maybe what we'll do is just wait a minute to see if folks have questions and I'll just keep an eye on the questions box. And if I don't see anything come in, we'll um, end the presentation here in a couple minutes. So I have 12.40 Eastern time right now. I'm just gonna wait another minute, see if there are any questions that come in. I think this means that Jean, you just did such an excellent job of explaining everything. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, excellent. We had a question come in from Raul. Um, so they asked, is there any interest at looking at the genus level of your Desulfobacterales? Yes, I think it will be cool to look at the genus level uh, of the Desulfobacterales, but uh, the max that we recovered from this study are not enough to resolve uh, these genomes at a genus level. So I think maybe more sequencing has to be done to be able to uh, further resolve the taxonomic um, identity of some of these desulfobacterialis uh, max. Thanks, Jean. Uh, we had another question that came in from George asking for clarification on MAG, M-A-G. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, MAG is basically a genome that is assembled from the metagenome. And um, these MACs are, they, they used to be called genomes, but like this term is basically uh, developed to be more specific to the fact that these are assembled from metagenomes and they may not represent like a pure isolate or a pure species. So often MACs have some form of like contamination in them and they are representing maybe like a group of different strains and different species. So they represent more of a population than an individual isolate or individual uh, species that you would uh, that you would identify in like a pure culture settings great thank you so much Jean. um we don't have any other questions that have come in thus far so i think we're going to go ahead and wrap up the presentation today so yeah thank you all so much for joining us today and Jean, thank you so much again for taking some time to um, present on your research today we really appreciate it a lot um, and before I let you all go, I do have to say that the NOAA Omics Seminar Series takes place on the third Wednesday of every month, generally at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, our next seminar will be on November 16th um, by Chanel Houghton, titled Evaluating Physiological and Immune Responses of Tanner Crab to um, Hematodinium Species Infection. Um, so registration for that seminar is up on the Omics website now. Um, and also, if you are interested in giving a talk for the Omics Seminar Series, feel free to reach out to noah.omics at noah.gov. We're always looking for um, speakers who have research that they want to present on. All right, so with that, we're going to go ahead and end the seminar. Thank you all so much for joining.